Good morning, everyone, everywhere, and welcome to worship with Homer United Methodist Church. To prepare for worship today, print out or pull up your worship guide so you can follow along with the communion liturgy. Prepare your communion elements, bread and juice or something like them. Take just a moment to lift up a prayer of gratitude for the indigenous people on whose land you live and get ready to light the second candle of your Advent wreath. On this second day of Advent, we light the candle of peace. Jesus Christ is a Prince of Peace, and peace is one of the fruits of His Spirit. Christ comes to bring justice, wholeness, and harmony to every relationship throughout all creation. He stands for peace with justice in every situation. Jesus, we pray that you will guide our feet into the path of peace. Dear God, as we journey down this Advent road, grant us the courage to make peace. Peace in our hearts, peace in our homes, and peace in our communities. Amen. Advent is a time of waiting, a time to open our hearts to God's presence, a time to pay attention to God's call. God's love breaks in over and over again. Let us pray. We are waiting, O God. We are waiting to hear your word. We are waiting to sense your presence. We are waiting with hope. We are longing for peace. Open our hearts that we may be renewed by your grace and transformed by your love. Amen. This is Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness 
proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Christmas is coming. Are you already ready or are you still preparing? We know that there is always so much to do. Presents to buy and wrap, a tree to set up and decorate, cards to write, menus to plan. And this year in particular, there's the added complexity of figuring out how to spend time with people you love without actually being together. There is a lot of prep work. But we know that these weeks leading up to Christmas are about more than preparing for December 25th. The season of Advent is a time of preparation. In these weeks leading up to Christmas, we prepare our hearts and our minds. We recalibrate our priorities. We reset our expectations. And we remember that Christmas is about more than a single day. Advent is a chance every single year to step back and look at the big picture of faith. Like we heard last week, we always begin with the end in mind, knowing there will be some time when God's kingdom is fulfilled here on earth as it is in heaven, but also knowing that it is up to us to start living out those kingdom values right now. The preparation that we do during Advent is an echo of the work that John the baptizer did as he preached repentance and baptism with water, all the while saying that one greater than him was coming. John prepared the people, not just to do a one-time action, but to be vigilant because change was coming, change in the form of Jesus the Messiah. And notice that in the book of Mark, Jesus does not come as a baby. There is no birth narrative in this gospel. There are no angels or shepherds or mangers. And that's a good reminder to us that the advent of Jesus was not just that first Christmas morning, but that Jesus comes to us again and again as a child, as a prophet, as a preacher, as a healer, as a teacher, as a friend. It's that adult Jesus that John announces in our text today. Now, I think it's easy to hear this scripture and write off John as a sweaty tooth madman. He is a striking, even scary figure. The scripture says that he appeared in the wilderness. He was clothed in camel's hair with a belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and honey. He sounds like the kind of guy that we would avoid eye contact with if we met him on the street. But John is not a raving lunatic. His placement and his appearance are highly symbolic. First, John came from the wilderness. Now, to Alaskans, wilderness is a good thing. When you talk about a remote place that's dangerous and filled with wild animals and there's no people for miles around, we think, that sounds great, let's go camping. <laughs> but that's not the way that those first listeners heard that word wilderness. We have to take ourselves out of our Alaskan mindset and put ourselves into the shoes of that early crowd surrounding John and the way that they would have felt about wilderness. In the scriptural imagination, the wilderness was not just a place, but a power. The wilderness was where everything antithetical to God lived. 
It was the place of desolation and loneliness, of isolation and fear. It was filled with wild animals and there was no food or clean water. It was an unsettling place. It was frightening and unnerving. For John's first listeners, far in the recesses of their cultural memory, they would think about those 40 years of wandering in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt, that time of famine and fear, of temptation and idolatry, of plagues and death. It was also the place of great manifestations of God through the gifts of quail and manna and water from stones. It was the place where God in all of God's awesome glory appeared as a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And, and that was scary too. The wilderness was a place of wild, unpredictable swings from deprivation to provision, idolatry to faithfulness, desolation to the actual physical presence of God. Remember that it was into the wilderness that Jesus was driven after his own baptism to face Satan's temptations. The wilderness is, is almost a character in its own right, and it's out of that wilderness that comes this man, John. John's unusual clothing mark him as a prophet, somebody who lived outside the, the bounds of normal society, somebody who practiced outside the, the structure of organized religion. And the honey and locusts that he ate were signs that he lived on God's providence alone. I hear an echo of Elijah in this description of John. And you might call to mind the story of God sending ravens to feed Elijah in his own wilderness. John is that kind of prophet who lives on the outskirts of society, who is fed by God alone. And John's role is to prepare the way of the Lord. Out of the wildness of the desert, John calls for order. He calls for peace in that place of chaos. He calls for repentance, a turning around of hearts and life. John prepared the way of the Lord by laying the groundwork, creating a foundational understanding of baptism and repentance. He encouraged people to hope for the Messiah to renew their faith in a new and different way of life, a different style of leadership, a, a different kind of power. He prepared people to turn their lives around, to live in more selfless and holy ways. And he ignited the spark of their desire for liberation from the way things are to the way things can be. John spoke to the people in the wilderness. And John speaks to us out of the wilderness as well. A wilderness that is not a physical location, but a spiritual one. T.S. Eliot said, the desert is not remote in some southern tropic. The desert is in the heart. In the, in the wilderness of our lives, in the wilderness of the pandemic, in the wilderness of political division, of racial injustice, of economic uncertainty, of family strife, of isolation and loneliness, John calls to us to prepare the way of the Lord. And so we prepare. We prepare ourselves to receive Christ however and whenever he manifests in our lives. We practice our spiritual disciplines of prayer and scripture study, of worship and acts of mercy. We examine our hearts and our habits. We seek forgiveness and reconciliation. We work for peace and justice. We repent and do better. These things don't just prepare us for some far off day of Christ's return. 
These things don't just prepare us to have ourselves a merry little Christmas. These things prepare us to see Christ every day, to see the way that Christ is already alive and at work in the world around us, to see where Christ touches our lives with fingers of peace in the midst of the desert. Today, we deck the halls with peace. We recognize the state of the world around us. We recognize the wilderness in our hearts and our lives. We recognize the relationships that are not as they should be, the division in our nation and our families, and still we long for peace. And still we work for peace because we know that even in the midst of the fear, the isolation and division, Jesus came into the world and Jesus continues to come into our lives. In your hearts and in your homes, I invite you to deck the halls with peace. Amen. set that's over 40 years old. Each piece handcrafted by a woman named Wilma at the First Presbyterian Church in Newton, Kansas. We lived in Newton when our children were born and we attended the First Presbyterian Church there. The tradition for that church was that each Christmas, each child in the church would receive one piece of a nativity set so that over the years, they would accumulate an entire set. This set is meaningful to me because we moved when our kids were two and five, and Wilma made the remaining pieces for each child so that they would each have their own nativity set. Anyone who knows me knows my life is not peaceful. In fact, it's more often chaotic than not. But this set reminds me of a time when in the midst of Christmas, 
there was peace. Because each of our children had their own nativity set, there was no fighting over who got to put baby Jesus in the manger on Christmas Day. There were no arguments over who got to move which character toward the stable throughout Advent to Epiphany. This Advent, I will deck the halls with peace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. God of our salvation, we do not deserve your love, yet you lavish it upon us. Not being content to be apart from us, you came to us in human form, donning flesh and becoming one of us. You are not a God that is removed from our reality, but is intimately present in our lives and our struggles. We lift up to you our thanks for your presence among us. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, the very incarnation of your being on this earth. With all of creation, with all the peoples in every time and place, we join the everlasting chorus. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We remember how you called your servant John to prepare the way. How you called your servant Mary to bear your son. How you called your servant Joseph to accompany her. How you called the wise men to search and the shepherds to ponder. How you called John to proclaim and Jesus to preach. How you called Peter and the disciples to follow and serve. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, when after having dinner with his friends, he took bread. He blessed it and he broke it, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, this is the cup of salvation, my love given for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the resurrection of our living Savior until he comes again. As we wait during this blessed rest called Advent, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered far and wide and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his love. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
as you receive these elements today. Know that this is the body and blood of Christ, which is given for you. Amen. Thank you so much for your continued generosity during this time. You can see in our church newsletter that there are a couple of opportunities to give to help people in need right here in our own community. One is to put together a Christmas blessing box. In years past, we've called this our reverse advent calendar. You uh, find a sturdy box or bag and use that list of items as your shopping list. And then you give it to the Homer Community Food Pantry so they can pass it out to people in need in our community this season. There's also a chance to join our United Methodist Women's Group in collecting Toys for Haven House, our local domestic violence shelter, to help give children who are in the shelter over their birthdays or holidays some gifts of love from our community. I also want to thank you for your generosity in supporting United Methodist Student Sunday. You are helping students all over the world go to college with scholarships from the United Methodist Church. Thank you for your generosity. If you'd like to make a donation to the church, you are welcome to visit our website where you will find our online giving portal or send a check to the street address on the screen. Your tithes, offerings, and donations are what keep the missions and ministries of our church alive. Thank you. In the darkness, the candle of peace burns brightly. In the quiet, the voice of the prophet rings out, prepare. In the wilderness of the soul, Christ is present. Amen. <laughs>